Okay. Hi, I'm Otto Penzler, and I'm at the Mysterious Bookshop in Tribeca in New York for our weekly conversation about books and collecting, and uh, this is a little bit different this week. As you know, if you've been watching, and if you haven't been, I'll tell you, uh, every week I've been featuring a different author, showing you uh, their books, uh, talking about how to tell first editions, giving you an idea of prices and so on. I'm not going to talk about a single author this week. I'm going to talk about something else, which is pulps, pulp magazines. As, as a bookshop, we don't really uh, actively sell a lot of pulp magazines. Uh, because we're open to the public, uh, they're very fragile. The pulp magazine major era is uh, in the 20s and 30s. They're fragile. And so if they're handled a lot, they get destroyed. But I do buy them sometimes, especially if they have interesting authors uh, in them, uh, for people who collect, say, Ellery Queen or Earl Stanley Gardner or Raymond Chandler or Dashiell Hammett. Uh, those writers all appeared in pulp magazines, and so I do collect them. <clears throat> Pulps, if, you, if you're not familiar with the term, um, were, uh, were got their name from the pulp wood paper that was used to produce them. Uh, it was the cheapest paper you could possibly get, and as a result, they haven't lasted very well through the years uh, because of their fragility. The paper oxidized because it was, it was made from wood pulp and, uh, and didn't hold up very well. So there, a lot of pulps are very, very scarce. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. The, the pulps began uh, just a little bit after the turn of the century. And, uh, and reached their heyday in, as I said, the 20s and 30s. Uh, originally, the pulp magazines were uh, mixed. They, they would have, one magazine would have a Western story, a romance story, a mystery story, maybe a fantasy or science fiction. Uh, but as they became more and more popular, the magazine started to focus on a single subject. And so they moved, uh, they, they would have as many as 500 titles a month coming out in pulps. And newsstands were filled with, with racks of, of these pulps, which were very inexpensive. And uh, they really were so, ex so uh, accessible to uh, even poor people because they were priced at only 10 cents or 15 cents each, uh, unlike books, for example. So you could go to a newsstand, find a pulp magazine for 10 or 15 cents, and have uh, a whole novel in the book, as well as several short stories. It's very common. Um, most of the most successful pulps were either mystery pulps or superhero pulps, like The Shadow or Doc Savage and that kind of uh, character, larger than life. Uh, stretched credibility a little bit, perhaps, uh, but they were fun. They were uh, they were easy to read. They were fun to read, um, and uh, writers who worked for them had to work really hard to make a living, because the standard payment to writers was a penny a word. In fact, there's a book about the pulps called A Penny a Word because that's what they were paid. The very top writers got all the way up to two cents. And it was known that Earl Stanley Gardner, in his early days, got up to three cents a word. And so did Carol John Daly. Carol John Daly invented the private eye novel in pulp fiction, in pulp magazines, in, the, in Black Mask magazine. Uh, and then wrote another uh, private eye story uh, with, about the same character, thereby creating the series Private Detective. And then Hammett wrote for Black Mask and it changed the landscape because now people knew that pulps could actually have serious literature as well as what is now known as pulp fiction. Pulp fiction today has a pejorative sound and makes it sound like the writers were hacks, uh, and many of them were. Believe me, a lot of the pulp stories uh, that I've read, and I've read a lot over the years, uh, are really awful. You could see they were being 
paid a penny a word because they're bloated. You know, it's not like he drove up uh, to the house and walked in. He drove up to the house and parked the car. He turned off the key. He opened the door, stepped outside, walked up the pathway, knocked on the door because every single one of those was another penny a word. <laughs> so while they have a reputation for being fast reads, many of them in fact were a little on the bloated side to, to increase the, uh, the payment that they would get. Uh, now Black Mask became the standard by which all pulp magazines were measured. Uh, they became the greatest of all the pulps. It's where all the greatest crime writers of that era writing hard-boiled fiction worked. It was Hammett worked there, uh, uh, Raoul Whitfield worked there, Frederick Neville sold stories there, Raymond Chandler, of course, and many others. That was, that was the standard. And, um, and it lasted until uh, 1951, so it had a very long run. That's enough about general background. Let me show you some pulps that I have in the store at the moment. Here's Street and Smith's Detective Story Magazine. Uh, this is uh, a very, very scarce pulp. Well, many of them are. I mean, I'll use that several times when I show you these books uh, because they are, in fact, scarce. But what a great cover, number one. They don't do covers like this anymore. <laughs> and um, in really terrific condition. Usually the spines are what took the, uh, the, the great bulk of wear and you would see them chipped badly. If you open the book a couple of times, the spine would split and all this, and that is not true in this case. Uh, just to put it in perspective, this, this particular magazine is priced at $100. Here's Detective Fiction Weekly. Now this magazine was the closest thing to a competitor that uh, Black Mask had. Detective Fiction Weekly was the, the second best-selling magazine, the second most prestigious, um, and it was, uh, unlike Black Mask, which was a monthly, this came out weekly, and uh, so it published a lot of stories for a lot of years. I have, uh, I have several, of, several issues of this, and, uh, but you know, they're not, it's not Black Mask, so they're a little bit less collected. These have happen to have Earl Stanley Gardner stories in them. And they're good, they're, they're kind of standard condition for pulp magazines. You can see that there's some wear on these at the spine as well as on the front cover. Um, these are, and they're chipped. Again, you know, they're just very fragile. These are priced at $35 each, so there's quite a difference. The Street and Smith's Detective Story magazine is rarer. Um, I'm showing you this, which is not a pulp, the, but the reason is that Argosy was one of the very first pulp magazines that existed, um, and it had quite a long run and remained a very, very successful magazine, and it morphed into a slick magazine, which is what these large paper uh, magazines are. And you can see, I'll just show you, maybe the light will reflect mm -hmm. off it, you can see it's, it's slick paper, and they were called, they were literally called the slicks. They paid much more than the pulps, and it was a great improvement for a writer to move from the pulps to the slicks. Um, this is, a, an, a, Ellery Queen is in that issue. I have a lot of Ellery Queen because I bought this large collection. Um, I'm gonna show you one more slick magazine called Mystery. This is an, a very unusual magazine because one of the things that uh, defined the pulps, especially the mystery pulps, is it was aimed at a male audience. The writers were male, the characters, the lead characters tended to be men, and um, the, uh, the, the target audience was male. But mystery magazine, the target audience was women. It doesn't look like a, like a women's magazine or woman's magazine, but it is. The stories, if you look at the pictures on the cover of these, almost always shows women, which you wouldn't ordinarily see in a pulp magazine. 
the pulps, if they showed women on the cover, it was generally a buxom blonde whose uh, her dress and, or sweater was essentially being ripped off her. Because female characters in the, in the pulps, in the mystery pulps, the, the female characters tended to be sidekicks. You know, they were um, secretaries, reporters, or women in distress who needed to be saved by the male hero. But that is not the case in Mystery Magazine. It's not really a pulp because it is slick paper, but it, had, but it looks like a pulp. It was published in the 1930s, just like the pulps, and have every um, uh, superficial element of pulp magazines, but, uh, but they're not. They're slick, and it's a rare magazine. It's very uncommon. These are these are and, and be, these are in beautiful condition. I mean, it's just remarkable copies, uh, and these are priced between like 175 and 275 each. Um, very very scarce. Here's a pulp. Mystery League. This was unusual. Again, it's uh, 1930s. I think 1934. Is that is that my memory right about that? 1933, of course my memory is wrong. Um, this was edited by Ellery Queen, who became a lot more successful when he started Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine in 1941. Uh, this is 1930s. He edited four issues. It only lasted, it's a pulp that lasted only four issues. It's a larger size than most pulps. You know, as I, I, I probably showed you, the pulps are normally this size, but Mystery League is larger. And it's, it had so much room in it because of the size that it was able to uh, publish full-length novels. Um, he edited four issues. This included this one included Drury Lane's Last Case, the, the fourth book that Ellery Queen and uh, that Ellery Queen, the brothers who were Ellery Queen, wrote under the pseudonym Barnaby Ross, but includes the full-length novel as well as other short stories. That's 300, by the way, because it's a fine copy. Look, look, there's almost nowhere on the spine and the cover, nice and bright, not, no chips and tears. Um, here's a magazine that I didn't, had never heard of until I bought this collection. And uh, there are three copies of it because the, uh, the Ellery Queen collector from whom I bought this collection kept upgrading to get a better and better copies. It's called Detective, Great Detective Stories. I thought it was a, a book that was published in pulp form, but it's not, it's, it's, a, it's a real magazine. So since I have three of them, they're relatively inexpensive, although it's, a, it's quite a rare pulp. I got some of my information about the rarity of these pulps from, uh, from, other, from a couple of dealers other booksellers that I know who specialize in pulps. And here's a very famous uh, pulp magazine called Blue Book. Very scarce, but, but widely collected. And uh, nice copies, as you could see. But they were uh, much more of a general pulp than a mystery pulp, although well, they all published mysteries. Um, it was unusual. As I said, most pulps at this point were becoming single uh, subject, whether it was aviation or railroads or westerns or romance. Uh, but Blue Buck stayed a, as a more general pulp. Um, for the heck of it, I just brought some, a couple of books here that I edited, uh, the big book of pulps, which is, believe it or not, still in print, and uh, the big book of black mask stories which collected the best of the Black Mask writers uh, in these massive books. It's like, they're like 25 or 28.95, the biggest bargain in the business. Vintage, uh, the Random House imprint at Vintage publishes uh, these books. Uh, and I've, I've done about 12 books with Vintage in this huge format, but uh, the Big Book of Pulps remains the most successful. I think it's in its sixth or seventh printing now. Anyway, there we are, the Pulps. Thanks for watching.